Hi, I'm Mark Johnson, and today we're going to take a look at Chapter 1 for your Unit 1, um, Week 1 uh, of this uh, biology course. So we're going to start out with some basic uh, organizational information about biology. And uh, within your discussion, you'll be telling us a little bit about yourselves. And uh, I think I've entered mine already for you. But uh, so we're going to start with a PowerPoint that we'll borrow some of the slides from that is from your book and uh, it is from the textbook companion site. Um, I suggest that you look at these and that you read your text and if you have any questions be sure to ask them on the discussion board or simply uh, email your questions to me if I think they are uh, uh, important enough uh, or if there's a concept that is too confusing uh, for people to get uh, quickly then I may uh, post the answer for everybody to look at, to share, uh, so that we can all be on the same page. Biology, what is it? It's the study of living things. That's what your book says. It's also the study of things that were once living and that may be, might be extinct. So we might be talking about things like the fossil record and so forth. People called systematists have been working for hundreds of years to classify living things into different groups that are based primarily on similar anatomical characteristics. But you know what? That's changing a little bit now because of the new findings that we have about DNA and our ability to look at the DNA of individuals. So in the past, things were classified basically upon uh, morphological characteristics that we could see, either with the naked eye or in a microscope. But now uh, we've gone, we're going beyond that. And that aspect of classifying based on DNA is pretty much young in its infancy. But in the past, we have classified living things into six kingdoms. The first one, represented by this purple glob, is archaea. The second, bacteria. Archaea and bacteria fall into a subkingdom group called prokaryotes. And prokaryotes are animals or plants, or, gee, they're actually neither animals nor plants. They're archaea and bacteria. They have no nucleus in their cells. Their DNA is floating free, maybe not so free, but it is not confined within a nuclear membrane in their cells. And then we have the kingdom called protista. Uh, these next four kingdoms all have nuclei in their cells. Protista are usually single-celled animals uh, or animals, not animals, see I'm saying animals again, organisms made up of individual cells that are uh, nucleated and uh, they may be made up of undifferentiated masses of cells uh, like sponges but uh, they do not have differentiation of tissues in them. Uh, then we move to a fungi, which a lot of people confuse and think of as plants because they're sedentary normally. But fungi are not plants. They are quite different than plants. They do not make their own food. They get their food from the decomposition of other living things that after they've died. Uh, usually, but not always. Sometimes they get them from other living things that are still alive. And then we have, of course, a large diversity of plant species in the world and a large diversity of animal species in the world. So these are fungi, plantae, and animalia. There are five properties of life that all living things have to have in order to be called living. Uh, plain and simple, and uh, we're going to talk about those. And then there's a sixth uh, that higher level organisms have that we'll talk about. First, there is cellular organization. All living things are composed of at least one cell. And uh, if there's no cell, there could be billions of cells like in humans, or there could be one cell like in a euglena or an amoeba 
or a bacteria. But there has to be at least one cell. And then there's metabolism. All living things use energy in order to live and to grow and reproduce and so forth. It all takes energy. So there has to be a food resource that any living thing is dependent upon. That can be a lot of different foods or it could be one type of food, but that food is used to derive the energy that that animal, plant, fungus, or lower um, classified organism needs to survive. All living things maintain a homeostasis. Homeostasis is a word that means um, that the internal environment of the organism is fairly constant, that it ranges within very narrow limits. For example, our body temperature stays almost exactly the same all day long. It does range a little bit, but it stays pretty much the same. Otherwise, the enzymes inside of our cells would not work properly and we would feel sick. And that's what happens when we get a fever. Our homeostasis is upset, and so we feel sick and we don't understand exactly why and we don't uh, we're not always able to pinpoint it and say, well, I, I feel sick because of this, or I feel sick because of that. The fourth property of life is growth and reproduction. All organisms grow. They start out small. The cells grow. They get bigger. Uh, the individual tissues grow. The organism grows, whatever. Uh, and they get bigger, and then they reproduce before they die, or they become extinct. So reproduction and growth is a property of life, and heredity is a property of life. Organisms pass their genetic information to future generations, so parents pass their DNA to offspring. There is a sixth property, um, and it's a general term, and it's called emergent property. Your book defines it later. I do it now. Uh, because I think it's more appropriate to do it now. But an emergent proper property are those attributes that we have which result from a combination of all those other aspects of all those tissues and organs put together. Uh, we have a consciousness, we have morality, we have social aspects, and we have emotions. and. Uh, we have cognition, which means we can think. We have metacognition, which means we can think about our thinking. Uh, that might be a little complicated, but uh, basically think about the emotion of love. Uh, we care about other people. We care about our family. We care about our friends. Um, this is an emergent property. Our individual cells can't do it. Our individual tissues can't do it. It is a property of our whole being because of the way all of our different tissues work together to make us unique individuals. So then let's talk about the way life is organized from the smallest atom to tissues and communities and so forth. We start out with atoms. Atoms can combine to be two or more from the same element or from different elements to become molecules like water, H2O. And then those molecules can even become more complex and become larger and become macromolecules like DNA, nucleic acids, proteins, carbohydrates, fats. All of these are the major molecules that make up parts of our body. And these molecules are put together in the right way. They form organelles inside of our cells. They're like little, little baby organs. But each cell needs organelles in order to be organized inside and to uh, be able to be alive. And then individual cells are formed, like this example, this nerve cell with a cell body and an axon. And this cell even has Schwann cells, which are separate cells surrounding the axon to insulate uh, from um, insulate the electrical pulse 
uh, between different axons. And then individual cells combine to become a tissue. Here's a, an example of nerve tissue. Those tissues work together and can develop into organs. Organ systems can develop into organisms and organisms develop into a species and a species has a population. A population are, is the same uh, species altogether in an area. Uh, a species, however, can be comprised of many populations of the same type of animal that exist over a broad spectrum of its range in different environments. A community is all the different species living together in an area that interact. In your city, you have trees and grass and cats and dogs and birds and people and raccoons and squirrels and so forth. And so there's a community, even in your city, uh, that is made up of organisms. When we get beyond organisms and add the features of the environment, which are uh, topographical, like mountains and plains and hills, and physical, like land versus water, lakes, rivers, streams, altitude, uh, so forth, then we have an ecosystem. That's all the living things, all the communities together in an area with all the non-living or abiotic factors. Now your book doesn't talk about this at this point, but when we take these ecosystems that are similar because they're in a similar climate for example, tropical ecosystems span the globe around the equator, north and south by so many degrees latitude. And although there are different tropical ecosystems, there is only one tropical biome. And so biome is the top level of organization of living things on the earth, unless we go one step farther, we can talk about the biosphere, which is the crust of the earth and all the living things associated with it, and all those abiotic factors within the top level of the earth, which includes the atmosphere, the soils, and minerals, and water tables that support all living things. That would be the biosphere. So this is an interesting uh, way to look at the beginnings of biology is, is how life has become organized. But how did it become organized? It became organized because of one thing. It became organized because of one phenomenon that we'll talk about in later chapters that created biodiversity in the first place and that is sexual reproduction, specifically the concept of meiosis combined with a small amount of spontaneous mutation, which is quite often environmentally uh, induced, either from natural phenomena in our environment, like radiation from space, or from man-made phenomena in our environment, uh, such as chemical uh, pollution. There are four unifying theories of biology. One is the cell theory, which sort of already talked about it, all living things come from cells and there is no living thing without a cell. And then there is the gene theory and that traits are carried um, on DNA and uh, the way that our bodies are controlled and, and uh, organized uh, is from the activity of the DNA messengers and the DNA templates that's within our uh, bodies. Finally, there's the theory of heredity, which has to do with passing those traits on through DNA to our progeny, and then the theory of evolution, which is how all biodiversity was created in the first place and might not be what you think it is. I think you'll find it very interesting to study evolution. Okay, that's it for now. In the next screencast, we're going to talk about the scientific method, and uh, I will post that one right behind this one.